You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode... We're showing our true colours in Fab Facts. We are following our dreams of becoming a law enforcer in The Randomizer. And we have an archive interview with Keith Shackleton from TV21. That's all coming up in pod 243. Of the... (coughs) Jerry Anderson Podcast! Watch it, you. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Ah, here well, we are. Hello, 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 Jamie. Well done for making it out of your sick bed. Oh, it's, I hate it. I've been mm. just such a sickly, poorly child. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I don't, and I'm not going to go on about it. But yes, no, no. For any of you who were waiting um, last week or the week before for the um, a Life Uncharted live stream, I had to cancel it yes, because yes. I managed to get myself very poorly indeed. Yeah, and. Um, spent a week in bed coughing and being disgusting so nice anyway there we go um i am the now hopefully less phlegmy jamie anderson yes and i'm the tip top and in the peak condition of health richard james that's very impressive Uh, and also another very healthy chap yes dale yes look at him picture of health Mm, the randomizer must be all the uh the, the radiation coming ah. from the randomised machine itself sometimes uh, somehow keeps well, him does, nice and healthy. D- does it? Does radiation do that? Uh, it, it does in yeah. this universe, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Anyway, Chris and his uh, radioactive healthiness will be here later on with the randomizer, where he randomly picks a random episode from a random Jerry Anson series That's true. and does yes. some random stuff about it. Yes. But there's loads of other stuff that isn't yes. at all random because <gasps> it's... Carefully planned and scripted every Curated, week. Curated, I think is the word. Curated. Isn't that a good one? It's certainly a word. Um, well, <laughs> would you like to uh, present the things on, that you've then. curated, perhaps in the style of... Go on. Uh, no, no, uh, no, no, an, no, no. An no, art gallery curator? No, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm simply going to tell you what's coming up All on right. this edition of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Boring. While you just take a couple of minutes, grab yourself a lem sip, spoonful of honey, and just calm down, okay? So, on now. well... <laughs> Coming up, of course, yeah, quietly, please. Oh, sorry. Quietly. sorry. Uh, we've got the wonderful Fab Facts, of course. I'm a new man when it comes to Fab Facts. I've seen the light. The scales have fallen from my eyes. And I now agree with the vast majority of the population that it's the most exciting thing in the Jerry Anderson podcast. Your sarcasm knows no <laughs> bounds, apparently. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we'll have that a little later, or rather, very shortly. Uh, then, <laughs> following that, we've got the Jerry Anderson news, 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 news. We because, do. as we know, there's always so much happening in the worlds of Jerry Anderson. We've got an archive interview with Keith Shackleton from uh, TV Twenty One coming up a little later on. No doubt, Jamie will be telling us a bit more about that nearer the time. If you like, we've got the randomizer, and yes, of course, we've been hearing from our wonderful podstrons. They've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. They've been hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast on Twitter, tagging me, Richard and James. Him over there with the sniffles, I'm Jamie Anderson. And him over there with the rosy cheeks, at Chris Dalek. Uh, And of course, we'll be dropping in on our wonderful Podstron's official listeners Facebook group to see what they've been up to as well. Uh, Well, I'm looking forward to all of that. I know. It's great, isn't it? Particularly now that you've found the light when it comes to facts. Yeah, I have. I have. I've resisted it, but uh, now I've given in. Okay. Well, let's see if that continues this week. Yeah. Uh, Any other exciting things going on in uh, the life of Richard James? (laughs) Well... I mean, if we're talking we, of you fab had a facts, recent what, birthday. Oh, oh, you mean in my personal life? Well, it doesn't matter where it is. Yeah, I did have a, a recent birthday. Yes, some, some happy sort of, birthday. A, a nice afternoon in a pub with lots of friends. Oh, lovely! That was nice. Thank you very much. But uh, back to Jerry Anderson. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. And fab facts in particular. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you're a subscriber to Doctor Who magazine, Jamie. Um, is it terrible that I'm not? Hmm. Well, Probably should be, shouldn't I? It looks like they've got the bug as well because they've got their very own Jerry Anderson Fab Fact in really? this month's issue. And in fact, it's one that we've already featured on Fab Facts. But after the actual Fab Fact, I will read out the Doctor Who magazine Fab Fact as well. As a wow, bonus. You're, you're really into it so there much so that you're I, I know. giving us double Fab Facts I, I voluntarily. Believe, I, know, I can't believe it's taken me so long. Goodness me. Well, I mean, should we do the preamble Fab Fact and yes. then you can... 
deliver the proper yes. meaty fab fact. Yeah, well, okay, let's let's try that. All right. Okay, fine. Uh, here we are with the the appetizer fab fact. Now, time for this week's fab facts. Right. Go on then. It's fab Come facts. On. I mean, yeah. I'm really excited. Come on. Uh, all right. Yeah. Oh, this is really. Book. You've got the book and everything. Oh, brilliant! This I, is brilliant. I've got the book. Oh. You're really throwing me off here. Wow. Can you stop it, it please? <laughs> As you could hear, Richard can't wait to shout fab, which will stop no. me in my tracks oh. when flicking pages from the book of fab facts. And so hopefully, exciting. there we will happen upon a fab fact, which. I mean, Richard may possibly even explode with delight at oh, this fab fact. It's going to be amazing. Right? I can so, feel it. Yeah. All right, fine. Well, look, uh, are you ready with your fab? I am born ready. Good, always. And uh, here we go with the pages. Fab! Oh. <laughs> See, I went for a quite a rapid flick I noticed. today. I noticed. Very dry thumb, I noticed. Uh, yes, actually. Yeah. I'm not quite sure where yeah. my thumb is so parched today, mm. but uh, I'll go and find some moisturiser for it later. Anyway, so our fab fact today... Ooh. Yes. Gosh. Okay. What? Well, I, I'm I'm going to enjoy this one anyway. Um, I wonder how many of our podstrons remember a rather distinctive talking car from Terra Hawks. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, yeah, I do. Yeah. The car in question was uh, well, Hudson. Hudson. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and Hudson was, of course, voiced by a friend of the show uh, and uh, Anderson alumnus Robbie mm-hmm. Stevens. Mm-hmm. And really, Hudson was the the kind of 1980s answer to Fab One. Mm. You know, the Rolls Royce Association continued, and uh, it uh, it sort of was one of the, the 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 hallmarks of a return by Dad to to the worlds of puppetry. I think. Yeah. Because it's sort of yeah. it's the thing that connects Thunderbirds and Terror and Terror Hawks. Really. Indeed. Indeed. Anyway, Hudson. Uh, as with so many of the best names and organisations uh, from the world of Anderson, Hudson is an acronym. And do you know what it stands oh, for, Richard? Hudson. Oh, horizontal. Um, no, no. No. Oh, yeah. Uh, honest. Honest. No. No. Um, no. No. Uh, ha, ha, I really don't know. Okay. Well, let me tell you. It's yes. heuristic universal driver with sensory and orbital navigation. Heuristic. I would never have got heuristic. Yes, Hudson. There we are. <laughs> so, no need for a chauffeur. With Hudson, of course, because mm-hmm. he was uh, self-driving. Mm. So uh, throughout the series, you see Hudson speaking with a very proper English accent. Oh yes! Uh, while he drove around Tiger Einstein and Kate Kestrel and uh, well, Sergeant Major Zero and many other passengers along the way. Um, but it was a, it was a really really nice voice, and I feel like Robbie really enjoyed doing it. Mm. Now. Uh, we've often speculated that Hudson was an inspiration for the likes of Elon Musk and innovators in the self-driving car industry, hmm. because he was truly self-driving. Yeah. But did you know that there is another feature of this rather fab Rolls Royce that has crept into the zeitgeist of automobilia? <laughs> the zeitgeist of automobilia? Yes. <laughs> Isn't that a Captain Scarlet episode title? <laughs> it should be. It's, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's a great title, actually. Isn't it? It feels like a Big Finish c- coming soon from Big Finish Productions. <laughs> the Doctor Zeitgeist. Who. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, all I mean is, you know, yes. into the world of cars. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, uh, now, some of you may have guessed it because you've seen it already. Richard, do you know the feature? No. Well, it's camouflage. A brace. So Terra Hawks fans will know very well that one of Hudson's most useful features was the ability to change colour at will. Ah. Oh. Did he did camouflage and mm-hmm. uh, pinks and blues and blacks and yellows and greens and yeah, yeah we know what colours are. Yes. Okay, sorry, just giving some examples there. You don't have to well, name them all. In January of last year, 2022, BMW unveiled a concept car. It called the iX Flow. Okay. Uh, it features a home theatre inspired entertainment setup in the back seat, and of course, the ability to change colour. Oh, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> which yeah, is mean, useful because. Uh, uh, we're not into useful uh, here. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, BMW sure. engineered uh, the, the latter feat by wrapping the car in what they are calling e ink. It's very easy mm. to say that, isn't it? E ink. Mm. E ink, yes. E ink, uh, which has properties similar to the screen of, say, an Amazon Kindle. One of those oh, okay. little, uh, you know, e-reader type things. Yeah. Now, the this electrokinetic phenomenon of electrophoresis... <laughs> right. ...is what powers these little uh, bits of technology. Okay. So, 
uh, electrophoresis there. Very important right. to remember. Yeah. Uh, this early prototype only does black, white and shades of grey, but it oh. can flash to help you find uh, your car in a car park, for example. Right. Um, add stripes, I guess, for the purpose of going faster. Obviously. Uh, or change from one shade of grey to another with oh. pizzazz. Okay, <laughs> right. So, what, grey to grey? That's pizzazz, is it? It's, it's the pizzazziest we're going to get today. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, unfortunately, the costs mean that such a feature is unlikely to reach production anytime soon, hmm. uh, but the home theatre setup in the back seat is available now for a mere $5,000 extra. Oh. <laughs> right. So, that, that's, you know, there's the silver lining. Yeah. <laughs> So while you can't actually drive uh, Hudson, you know, your own Hudson around town, you mm. can watch Terror Hawks, mm. sounds good, on a 31-inch 8K screen with oh. 4D surround sound in the back, ah. back seat of a six-figure car. Nice. Sounds yeah. like quite the date night, doesn't it? Hey, what are you suggesting? Doesn't it? Uh, what? Do you not? Uh, oh, bit awkward. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, so, <coughs> Posterons, uh, um, what uh, Anderson vehicle would you like to drive during your morning commute? Ah. Perhaps uh, an SPV, SUV? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or uh, some uh, pod vehicle subcompact? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, nice. Whatever you like, really. Yeah. Uh, do let us know. Podcast at jerryanderson.com. Okay, great. Nice. Of course, I would like to do my commute in a space precinct police cruiser of course, of course you of course would that are actually in the and of themselves are, are actually really cool craft from the Jerry Anderson universe that we don't really talk about that much no they are certainly are a lot they? cooler than uh, the green hopper from space precinct yeah yeah which we really don't talk about no much. no definitely not that it's true that. but yeah. no the cruiser so was, was a, great but that was an interesting fan fact because you started by telling us that uh, there was a real life Hudson but then as the fact continued we worked out that actually the real life Hudson was nothing like the actual Hudson. It was just a car that could turn grey <laughs> and had a screen in the back. Yeah, all right. Well, if you if you watch uh, Terror Hawks in black and white, then it's almost imperceptibly, you know. Yeah, it's just. Anyway, you know, I, was, I was really looking forward to that, and I think I've, I, you might have just put me off Fab Facts. Well, don't worry. You've got a backup Fab Facts. <laughs> That's so, true, I have. do you want to do the backup fair fact, and we can compare and contrast? Well, yes. I mean, this is one that we have featured before. Uh, in fact, it's about the Doctor Sonic Screwdriver. This was uh, in this month's Doctor Who Monthly, uh, when they're talking. Oh no, Doctor Who Magazine. Now I'm showing my age. Yes. It used to be called Doctor. Not the seventies anymore. Doctor Who Magazine. That's right. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, they're talking about uh, the Pertwee era um, Sonic Screwdriver, and they say it actually originates from two separate Jerry Anderson productions. The 1966 movie Thunderbirds Are Go and the 1967 TV series Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons. An exhaustive research, or rather as exhaustive research by Brian Terranova of Rubber Toe Replicas shows, the main body of the Pertwee Sonic first appeared, minus the cone-shaped emitter assembly, as an ordinary non-Sonic screwdriver in a live-action shot from a sequence in the Thunderbirds film. The crucial top section started live as a microphone in the model spy episode of Captain Scarlet, only this time in scenes involving puppets, giving the illusion of a much larger object. Oh. Oh, you see? So even Doctor Who magazine are getting in on the Fab Fact Act. Fab Fact Act, brilliant. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's good. Do you? Because we've done, yeah. the, we've done the screwdriver. I don't think we yeah. had the Captain Scarlet element, uh-huh. so that's a nice... There we are. Addition to our yeah. compound fab fact. Exactly. There. there you go. So, two for the price of one this week. Amazing. Well, I don't think I can top that. So, no, uh, fair enough. I guess that brings us to the end of this week's... Bog off fact! <laughs> I was just going to say fab facts. <laughs> but... Oh, well, buy one, get one free is the you know, sort of thing I went for. Yeah, nice. Yeah, okay. Bog anyway. off. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm not as excited about fab facts as I was at the beginning of this podcast. Maybe next week... You'll redeem yourself. Um, well, I mean, it's all down to the random flicking of the pages. So actually, mm, okay. really, if you're feeling let down, then you've let yourself down with your ill-timed fab. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, over to our email postbag, because as ever, our wonderful podstrons have been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. For example, Simpsons Clips 24 says, Hello, Richard and Jamie. Uh, I was listening to the most recent Time of Writing edition of the podcast when I heard you two discussing unseen characters in Anderson shows. And when Richard asked, What other unseen characters can you think of from the Jerry Anderson universe? And which of them would you like to see come to life? I was instantly reminded of a couple of unseen characters in a certain 
Lavender Castle. Of course it was. Yeah. Uh, these were the president of Flora in the episode Collision Course and a disc jockey for Radio Galaxy in Raiders of the Planet Zark. Now, I suspect that had there been a second series, we would have seen these characters in person. Unfortunately, I'm no Rodney Matthews when it comes to art, so I haven't been able to draw what they would have looked like. Oh, but, shame. Yeah, what do you think, regardless, says Simpsons Clips 24. Well, yeah. I'm sure they would have looked cool. Yeah, um, nice. But yeah, that's that's one of the things with budgets on these things you can't yeah. always show every character no. particularly when they've only got a couple of lines well that's right so you have to make that decision okay well maybe we'll just hear them that's exactly. a bit cheaper uh greetings mr anderson mr james and mr dale says dom riley i hope you're doing well uh in answer to your question as to what was predicted or presumably took inspiration in the thunderbirds of mighty atom the hood destroys an atomic station which strangely predicted chernobyl in 1986 when he partially destroys the saharan station that I wonder if they had drawn inspiration from the wind scale or now Sellafield fire of 1957, judging by the design of the containment building at wind scale. The second Sahara plant also predicted the partial meltdown at Three Mile Island in 1979. Although even more eerily was the fact that the film The China Syndrome was released on the 16th of March 1979, a mere 12 days before Unit 2 at Three Mile Island suffered a partial meltdown. I know this seems morbid, says Dom, but Jerry's work predicted some uh, technological advances that could go wrong. Anyway, I digress. Keep up the great work, chaps. FAB, SIG, PWOR and SPA from Dom Riley. Well, yeah. thanks, Dom. Predicting the future or just, uh, you know, stuff coincidence? Happening. Yeah, that's right. Pro probably it's just stuff happening. True. Uh, Bill Buddendorf got in touch to say, Hi, Jamie and Richard. I finally was able to order a Life Uncharted. I'm in Philadelphia, PA in the US, and watched it as soon as it arrived. It is truly fab. The design and aesthetic of it is lovely and engaging and fits perfectly. And the story unfolded in such a moving way. I just love it. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing such a personal story with us. Bill continues, Will there be a US release with all the extras that you've been talking about on the pod? I'll happily buy it again digitally or on Blu-ray to access all those goodies. I'm wishing for Dr documentaries of that calibre for each of Jerry's major TV projects. Bill continues, my partner and I headed for Tokyo, our first trip to Japan, to celebrate my 50th birthday. We'll be on the hunt for vintage toys and collectibles. Anything Anderson that we should be looking out for that we could only find in Japan? And lastly, are you gents fans of the YouTube show Toy Shop on Tour? It's so good, and the hosts occasionally encounter Anderson gems and clearly love it when they do. They would be fun guests on the podcast. Uh, love to hear you pick their brains about collectors' relationship to Anderson collectibles. Thank you both for everything. Cheers. And that's from Bill Button. Oh, thanks, Bill. Yeah, isn't that nice? Well, lovely, kind words. Yes, yes. Uh, so, in a US release, possibly, um, with all the extras. So, I don't think that um, there's going to be a separate US release of, of the additional stuff. However, I believe that the network Blu ray is region ABC, so ah. it can be watched in the ah, US okay. or anywhere. Yeah. So, if you want the extended version, then you can, um, can grab that Blu ray, Bill. Nice. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for your kind words. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes. And uh, Toy Shop on tour. Do you know that uh, YouTube show? It sounds interesting. I don't yeah. know them, actually. We'll look out for that. So, yeah, we should look them up. But interesting stuff. And in Japan, I mean, there's loads of Japanese merch, which doesn't make it around the rest of the world. So just right. go and check Keep it out. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they've got some, some great stuff. They've been doing some interesting collaborations with other Japanese brands that you might not expect that look kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, great. I'm sure you'll have a great time. Uh, Duncan Moss got in touch to say hi Jamie, Richard and Chris I have found a Jerry Anderson Beatles connection uh, Duncan is a fan of both of course in 1969 a pilot was made for a proposed puppet series that I believe was called Tommy Travels it was made by Apple Films which was owned by the Beatles and filmed their Get Back and Let It Be sessions the Apple company were not in a good state of affairs which might have been the reason a series was not forthcoming Denise Breyer voiced one of the characters and Arthur Provis was also involved it seems the poor man has been involved in more uncommissioned pilots than British Airways. No. I, I understand, however, that a print of the episode resides with the BFI. On the subject of resurrected merchandise, could we perhaps have the Jerry Anderson Viewmaster collection? Asks Duncan. Viewmaster enjoyed a very healthy relationship throughout the uh, 1960s and early to mid 70s. And they also issued a Terrorhawk set in the 80s, and I believe are still going strong. I'm delighted about the 16, 12 figurines and hope the sets will continue indefinitely. After all, there are a lot of characters to cover, and while I think this mixed approach is right for the ITC global characters, Terrorhawks or Space Precinct characters should be released in their own sets, should there be an interest in them. All the best, Duncan. 
Well, I'm all for a space police or space precinct characters being released. Of course you would be. Of course I am, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Of course, of course. Very good. Yeah, interesting part of that. It's always nice to, you know, find out more stuff that Denise Denise was in. I would love to to see or hear that. I'm guessing it's not available, though. Yeah, It's in the archive at BFI only. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, do you know much about Viewmaster? Do you remember the Viewmaster? uh... I have a Space 1999 Ah. and Thunderbirds Viewmaster here, and I'm sure when I was a kid I had, uh, yeah, probably again, Thunderbirds Viewmasters. Hmm. Um, nice. We did actually look into the potential of doing some Viewmaster related stuff, yeah. Um, but it's tricky because I think is it is it a Mattel brand? I think Viewmaster, I don't know. right, right. So that instantly makes things sort of prohibitively yeah. expensive to do. Yeah. But um, never say never. Mm, fair enough. And finally, Scott Anthony Bekleke got in touch to say, in answer to Pod Two Forty, with the question asked by Richard James, which of the Jerry Anderson's hits and series have you never seen before that has really surprised you? I can give you an easy answer. Uh, Scott says it was Terror Hawks, the first hey. time I ever saw it during the pandemic lockdown in twenty twenty, and I really enjoyed it. Mark Simpson Wedge suggested I should watch it and enjoy it, and I did. I love the storylines. I love the Zeroids, including Sergeant Major Zero, voiced by Windsor Davis, and the character reminds me of Davis' character, Sergeant Major Williams, from Dane Darpot. Man, uh, mum, rather. Uh, really enjoy that show a lot, and I will continue watching it. And that's from Scott. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, that Scott. Have yeah, you tried the audio right. series? I do hope so. Ah, mm. uh, there we are. All for now, but do keep them coming in. Podcast at jerryanderson.com, and I shall endeavour to read them out next time. Core cool. endeavouring. Mm. Yeah, always. What a great aim. Yeah. Uh, lovely. Well, uh, would you like some Jerry Anderson news to tide you over while you recharge your endeavour batteries? Not off. Good. Here it comes. Yes, indeed. It's this week's Jerry Anderson flusy news. flus flus flu. Not flus. Sorry, news, newsy news, news, news. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, Sorry. more newsmonia than. <laughs> do, do you get it? Anyway. Yeah, I do get it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, as mentioned, sickly child here mm. uh, had to cancel or postpone last week's A Life Uncharted live stream, which is now rescheduled for the seventh of February. That's tomorrow after the day of release. Uh-huh. Now, it's actually worked out quite well, I think, because lots of people have now been able to watch it. And can now, ah. I hope, join the live stream to ask yes. questions about their watching experience rather than ask stuff about a thing they hadn't seen. So, Fair enough. You yeah. know, sometimes these things work out well. Yep. So we'll be live, uh, hosted by David Monday, and uh, it'll be me and Ben Field chatting all sorts of nonsense, answering your questions from 6pm on Tuesday the 7th. Um, unless we have to reschedule again for some reason. But Uh-oh. hopefully we won't. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, now, as we mentioned last month, every month this year, on the 10th of each month, we're going to be celebrating something Terrorhawksy as we Hooray! head towards the 40th anniversary um, of Terrorhawks. It kind of mm-hmm. seems amazing that it's 40 years old. Uh, so, yes, the 10th of February, we've got the Terrorhawks story, which will be available uh, on our YouTube channel and across social media. So watch it there and you'll find out all about Terrorhawks. Oh, great. Uh, Chris Thompson's been a busy boy. Has he now? Yeah. Three new right. t-shirt designs, Skydiver, Ooh, three? Stingray, yeah. and some little oik called Joe 90. Ah, mm, nice. Interesting. But they're great. available for you now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we announced last week the pre-order going live for 5 Star 5, <gasps> Book 2, yes. the Doomsday Device. Yes. So, uh, Richard... Give us a little mm-hmm. insight there. Uh, what's going on? What can we expect? Ah, uh, what, well, and what's that thing on the cover? What is that thing? Well, the Doomsday Device itself, you mean? Mm. Is it? Oh, have you just? Is that a spoiler? It might be. I'm not going to say too much about that. But it's a continuation of the story. We all know that John Lovett and the Zargon Threat was an adaptation of a, uh, an unmade uh, Jerry Anderson uh, screenplay. Well, this was my opportunity to take those characters and sort of spin them off onto new adventures. So we visit jungle planets, we visit a prison planet, uh, we grapple with the doomsday device itself, uh, we come to understand exactly why the Zargons wanted to invade Kestra in the Ooh. first place, and we're introduced to a brand new villain. A brand new villain? Oh, yes. Lovely. Mm. Well, there you go. Uh, five star five, the doomsday device, will be available later this month in collector's hardback. Lovely. Uh, which we expect to sell out fairly swiftly. So if you do want to make sure you get that, pre-order yep. it, and uh, you'll have it by the end of the month. Lovely. Uh, and um, it'll then join the ranks of our paperback collection, including uh-huh. Five Star Five Book One, which is available, as yep. well as um, IGR Four. Yeah. Uh, and Great. maybe there, there's loads of stuff, all available via um, Amazon and the Jerry Anderson store. Mm-hmm. Now, Lovely. if you fancy yourself 
a little game to test your Jerry Anderson knowledge. <laughs> and can I highly recommend you pop over to our YouTube channel, oh, yes. where Chris Dale has been hard at work yet again and has created a fantastic video where you have 10 seconds, uh, little 10 second snippets of various theme tunes from throughout the Anderson Library uh, where you have to guess what the show is. Now you think you might think, well, that's easy. Let me tell yeah. you. It ain't that yeah, easy. Oh, there are right, some okay. you're going to struggle with, I suspect. Oh, wow. Great. So head over to youtube.com slash TV and you can watch it there. Let us know your score. Oh, Either post idea. it in the comments underneath or email us podcast at jerryanderson.com. Uh, let us know which ones you found easy, which ones you found challenging, and uh, and what your score was. And perhaps we could do a little um, a little ranking next week. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. See how we get yeah, on. I'll okay. go as well. Yeah. Fine. Uh, right. Well, I think that's probably about it. There's definitely some other stuff going, but uh, that's enough for this particular moment. So that is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. Well. I mean, I know I say it every week. Do but, you? Well, so much news every week. Yeah. What are the things you say every week? Oh, fun fact. Uh, so much news. There's always stuff going on in the universe. Yeah, well, hang on. Revatings, well, blah, sorry, blah, blah. Sorry, are you saying I'm nothing if not predictable? I'm saying you're reassuringly, predictable. comfortingly predictable. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, fair enough. Well, I'm going to do something utterly predictable now and head over to our Facebook group. That's <gasps> facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons. Yep where the official listeners to the podcast have been having a good old time. Uh, David Hollis, crikey, his bank account must be empty because uh, he's received not only the Secret Service special LP that's just come in, but to complete his Christmas present to himself, the Fire and Fury Thunderbirds audiobook. Nice. Which David says is well worth the wait. Oh, good. Yeah, I'd agree with him there. Alex Patrick says, I've been reading Jack Knowles' reviews of Stingray, and I love that he keeps likening the plots to real-world scientific events. If only he'd held back his review of The Cool Caveman, then he could have uh, declared that they were responsible for this. And uh, Alex then posted a link to a a story that's been everywhere this week about the Australian authorities trying to track down uh, a lost radioactive capsule. Mm. Ah, yes. It sounds very Anderson, doesn't it? It does, it does, it does. Uh, yeah, very well, good. And, and that's also a bit like the, uh, when, the, was it the kid dug up in their garden a radioactive capsule from a oh, dinky right. eagle? And oh, yeah. I can never that's remember right. if that's a, a myth or, a, yeah, yeah. A, or truth, but let's, let's yeah. pretend it's true. <laughs> let's pretend it's true. Uh, Jonathan Westall. Uh, now, I'm not saying you upset a lot of people, Jamie. But really? there are a lot of our podstrons who are very keen to show that they are among the 6% or so of listeners who do actually subscribe to the podcast oh. after your groaning and grumbling. I'm uh, not sure I groaned or week. grumbled. I think I just <laughs> very lightly rolled my eyes. Yeah, well, Jonathan Westall posted a screenshot of his having subscribed to the podcast to say, to prove that I've subscribed to the Jerry Addison podcast and I'm not one of the 93.7% that Jamie grumbled about this week. Gr- grumble's probably a fair term. I did I did a little <laughs> bit of a grumble. Sorry, sorry. I'll stop grumbling. Uh, yeah, Joanne Bennett says, I've been a subscriber on Apple since the beginning. Same with the Randomizer podcast too. Nah. So that's nice, isn't it? Uh, Daniel Ross Dudley says, just to let everyone know, that new Captain Scarlet is now available on both ITVX and BritBox. It is. Um, and on ITVX, I think, Emma Nichols noticed that they'd spelled Captain Oka wrong. Oh, as, really? uh, as Captain Oka, O-double-C-A. Uh, oh. Well... I mean, rest assured, she put them right and they've actually messaged her and pledged to correct the mistake. So that's good, isn't it? I'm very glad to hear it. Quite right yeah, to Yeah, 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 yeah. Earl Black uh, says, Life Uncharted DVD arrived yesterday, so I finally got to see it in Australia, a year behind everyone else. Our BritBox has no Jerry Anderson. What an incredible piece of work, says Earl. So well balanced. So many bits of it were just so sad. And the bit at the end made me cry. Incredible work. Thank you to all involved. Fantastic making of featurette uh, and absolutely brilliant. But be prepared for tears. Thank you for producing this, says Earl. Oh, oh, thanks, Earl. That's, That's really lovely. lovely. Yes, we've uh, we've had lots of lovely messages and emails and stuff. So thank sure. you, thank you all kindly, and I'm very glad that uh, those of you who couldn't see it until now are finally able to. Yeah, indeed. Talking to Five Star Five, and we were a moment ago, James Charles Munro says, great news about there being more Five Star Five on the way. I have to ask, will there be an audiobook version as well? And will Intergalactic Rescue 4 get any more audio uh, beyond just the first part that we've already heard? Uh, so IGR4, yes, it's fully mm-hmm. recorded and we'll ah. be releasing it later in the year. Yep. Five Star Five, not sure yet, actually. Okay, fair um, enough. That's Yeah. yeah just yeah. We, we haven't, uh, haven't locked it in yet. Yeah, so yeah. TBC. Right. Uh, and Richard Goodborn, 
for now has posted, Dear Corgi, please, 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 with extra cherries on top of Grandma's Tracy, Grandma Tracy's pies, can we have a die-cast Thunderbird 5 and Fire Flash? Oh, and Fire Flash, goodness yeah. me. Yeah, doesn't I mean, want much, does he? Well, I mean, David um, did talk about uh, mm. Thunderbird 5. I don't yeah. think... Did we, did we maybe very lightly mm. mention Fire Flash? I can't remember, mm. but... Let's let's keep our fingers crossed for uh, for Thunderbird Five. I feel like there's a real opportunity there. So. No, yeah, exactly. And when I first read uh, Richard's post, I thought he was actually asking for a diecast uh, uh, version of one of Grandma Tracy's pies, which sort of rather confused me a bit. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> with, well, I'm glad you carried on, on reading. Yes, yes, very important that. <laughs> anyway, all for now. Uh, but do pop over if you're on Facebook to our group. It's growing steadily. I think we're up to 925 odd Whoa. members now. I know. Hang I on. We... Get, do you want to rephrase that? Okay, not odd members. Perhaps I should say <laughs> 925 wonderful members. Thank you. <laughs> Bit harsh. Uh, which I think is at least uh, up on a dozen or so from the last time we spoke about this. Yeah. So that's, come on, let's get it to a thousand by the end of this year. A thousand that's is plan, a lovely number. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, great. Yeah, I'm quite on, right too. Uh, yeah, so all for now, but go along, uh, answer a few questions, we'll let you in and you could join in the fun. Uh, and it is fun, isn't it? It is, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Nicest place on the internet. Somewhere to hang out, isn't it? Mm. That's somewhere to hang out. You make isn't it sound it? like a, you know, like a parade of shops or something. <laughs> yeah, like a precinct of some sort, perhaps. Yeah, all right. Let's, no? let's not all continue right, down that route. All right, all right. Uh, would you like an interview? Because you're getting one whether you oh, like yeah. it or not. Yeah, I would. No, who's this then? Uh, well, this is Keith Shackleton, a name that you ah. may not know that well. Mm-hmm. If you've got the extended version of A Life Uncharted, you will have seen one of the extended bits of Keith talking about how he and Dad met and how they got on. They met in the RAF days, um, became friends, ended up working together, and then Keith went on to essentially found the Century 21 merchandising empire. Right, yeah. Um, And he ended up really, I think, setting the template for how licensing and merchandising and publishing were handled by by brands so mm-hmm. it's, it's quite spectacular really yeah. um so we we were lucky lucky enough for the documentary to be given tapes uh, of keith's interview um which sadly it, the video quality wasn't good enough to be included uh, in mr thunderbird the original documentary for which it was filmed ah. or putting too much of it into ours which is a great shame it was all a bit soft yeah. um but the audio is great keith is a great raconteur and tells us all about uh, how he got involved with Dad and um, the, his, their career. Lots of opinions on how things worked, why they did and why they didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a really fascinating man. Sadly, died a few years ago. Um, mm. So we're very lucky to have access to this. So here's the first part of uh, an interview with Keith Shackleton. Keith, how did you first take your head? Well, it goes back a long time. Uh, Jerry and I were in the Air Force together just after the war. And uh, which was quite a good time to be in because you had the excitement, experience, and free thinking that came through from some of the guys who'd been in the war. And we ended up at uh, Manston together in air traffic control, which in fact was the root of all the technology that you see in the series, particularly in, in Thunderbirds. And we've got, I could, I've got a minor stories I could tell you about that, but I probably haven't got the time to fit them in in this particular session. But Jerry and I used to socialize. We played tennis together. We played chess together. I used to beat him at one of them. I can't remember which it was, but uh, a lot of fun. Um, after that, uh, we kept in touch. We used to have a pint every year. And late 50s, at least 1960, he said, why don't you join our outfit? I said, Jerry, I know nothing about filmmaking. And I've got a very secure job. I was business manager at the time of industrial and trade fairs and we were just involved in doing the first British trade fair in Moscow which was quite exciting. The only fly in the ointment as far as I was concerned was my immediate boss who didn't have any imagination or sense of humour and Jerry persuaded me that it would be a good move so I rang my wife and I said darling I've done something silly. She said what have you done? I said I've taken a job with a company called AP Films and uh, it's, uh, I, I joined the company in mid-60, I think it was. So in May I was in Moscow, in July I was, found myself in, in New York uh, selling, placing the rights in Supercar, which we'd just made. And uh, we did a reciprocal deal, 
place to the right of the company, a guy called Stan Weston, had an office on Central Park South, and he had the rights in Dr. Kildare. Do you remember Dr. Kildare? Came back and uh, placed the best publishing deal in the world. I mean, the books are terrible books, six books which were unreadable, but they had a picture of Richard Chamberlain on the front. And uh, placed a deal with Collins, and we sold one and a half million books, which gave us some money to work on in the in the, in the, uh, the merchandising company. So I joined, we had a small office on the Slough Trading Estate, brick walls, one desk, clean sheet of paper, no secretary, telephone. But I think we had the drive, we were probably the the dot-com company of the 60s, that's my view. And uh, looking back, I think Jerry was the, he was the king of hardware, and Sylvia was the queen of software. And they made a, I mean, perfectly creatively, it was absolutely magnificent. Jerry was marvellous with uh, the vehicles, the explosions, the special effects, and Sylvia's characterization and voices and so forth, uh, well, they, uh, they were brilliant. And the other members of the team, there was uh, Reg Hill, who was an extraordinary artist, very creative, and he could capture some of Jerry's and indeed some of his own visions and do the most magnificent full-color illustrations of space vehicles and whatever. And the other guy was John Reed, who was a lighting cameraman and... Uh, again in his own field quite brilliant so we had a wonderful team of you know five people um, plus all the other talent that came on board Derek Meddings and the Brian Johnsons and the Bob Bells I, I can't remember all the names now but it was a it was a marvelous time to be uh, and I, I look back with great affection on those times and I, my only sadness is that um, it couldn't have continued. I'm a great... Uh, I stay with projects, and I like things to go on forever. And uh, I think it could have gone on forever, but it didn't. Uh, but we did have some wonderful times, and uh, I say again, it was, it, was, it was great. Does that answer the question? Just picking up there a little bit on your RF, that is, did you used to drink uh, socialising generally? Oh, yes, 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 yes. We used to, uh, believe it or not, we used to get on our bicycles and cycle into Margate. And I can't remember the name of the pub, but there was a pub there we used to, it was our first port of call. And there was this rather effete young, well, he was, we, um, I say young man, he was older than we were, but uh, he used to play the piano. And I remember his favourite piece was, I've been a waff, I've been a wren, I've done my bit boys for you so-called men, but I'm a good girl, a good girl now. I mean, <laughs> that was his party piece, and he used to give that every Saturday night. So after a couple of pints, we'd um, uh, either have a game of darts or we'd go back to the camp. Or, uh, but Jerry, um, was, he hadn't played rugger in his youth, so he didn't know how to handle a pint. And I'd been from a school, and we, had, we did play rugby, and uh, I was initiated in the art of handling a pint. So I used to um, hold his hand and tuck him into bed at the close of the proceedings. But uh, again, with... So, Yes, how do we, we, and we used to go. I used to go to his home in North London. Met his mama, who was quite a difficult lady. But I say we used to play chess. I think I'm sure it's chess. I used to beat him at. And okay, at tennis. He was probably better at tennis than myself. But um, we had fun. We had fun, and that was the basis. I mean, we were quite disparate and separate, and quite different people. But uh, we seemed to have um, a certain uh, chemistry that worked, and uh, we had fun. We were at Manchester when they had the air disaster. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it was Battle of Britain Day, and I think it was September sometime, I can't remember the day. And there was this guy, I can't, again, I can't remember his name, but I met him, a pilot, and he was giving an air display with a mosquito. And he came in low uh, over the airfield, did a barrel roll at about 150 feet, and didn't pull out, and he, he hit the road... Uh, there were two engines on a mosquito hit the road up either side cabbage field hit cars I mean there was absolute mayhem and uh, I was probably well I was on the air uh, the air traffic controller I wasn't on duty but um, it was uh, I can still feel the, the, the gut feel now when it, it happened and quite a few people were killed including the pilot of course and 
this poor chap's wife was she was there and she saw it happen so the answer yes I, I did see that and uh, I, that will stay with me forever Oh, beyond doubt. I mean, the whole, I think the whole ethos of, uh, of the supermarination and the special effects came from uh, uh, air traffic control. I mean, there's nothing more. You're sitting there at your control desk, which in today's terms is relatively primitive, but, uh, you know, you had your RT, radio telephone equipment, and... That was about all. I mean, you could talk to the home of the direction finding base, uh, and you were just talking to the, the pilot and talking him down, uh, either in fair weather or foul. And the jargon that you hear in the Thunderbird is almost straight out. Of, it is straight out of, uh, out of the, the book for um, the RAF. And, uh, so yes. It certainly had an influence, and I'm sure... I mean, Jerry has a very technical mind, and um, it stayed with him, and he developed those thoughts and brought them to life in, in, in well, supercar, you know, fireball. It's all part of the, the whole of the whole scene. And Jerry and I are of a similar age. I, I can pull rank on him, actually. I'm three weeks older to the day than Jerry. So I, if we ever got into a... I, I said, Jerry, look, I'm three weeks older than you, so it's my, my, my view must come across and can't... But, uh, so, uh, yes, the answer to your question, the word is yes, without doubt. Did, uh, what was the first series to benefit from the Imagine Well, the first one we really tried was Supercar. And contrary to, you know, I, I used to do a lot of co- what I call cold, well, it's still what you call cold calling, knocking on people's doors. And you got a fairly dusty reception from some people. I remember walking out of one office, a fairly major toy company, and... Uh, they were, you know, they were quite rude. I said, well, you know, if, if this is your approach to it, I don't even know why you've given me the time for a meeting, because, you know, you, you, so I, I didn't, I said, I think I'll close the meeting, so I walked out with my... There, yes, there's no doubt that we were uh, at the leading edge of uh, licensing. I think Disney were, had tickled it uh, without realising what they were doing. I mean, they had Mickey Mouse and, and all the rest. But we were the first UK company, I think, of any consequence... Uh, to tackle it, I was going to say scientifically, it wasn't. We were driving it by the seat of our pants, and I think a lot of businesses, uh, it's um, it's inspirational. It's how you feel about it. Uh, but I got hold of Supercar, and I say I took it to America as a project. Uh, the reason being that uh, ATV through their distribution company, ITC, we got a phone call one day and said, oh, we placed the rights with a company called LCA, Leisure Concepts. No, sorry, Licensing Corporation of America. And we gently pointed out that they hadn't got the right to do that. So we had a quick meeting at uh, Slough, and it was decided I should go to the US of A, which I did. So I was uh, full of self-confidence, and um, as one always is. And I got to New York, and I... I went in to see, uh, God, I can't think of his name, the head of ITC, a lovely man. And he didn't have any problems. I said, these are our rights, so I took them back. And I walked out with the rights and went, had a meeting with uh, Stan Weston, who eventually became LCI, um, Leisure Concepts, Inc. And the wheel goes full circle. 20, 30, 25 years down the line, we did a deal with them. Uh, the daughter was running it, Cindy Weston. And we, the last major licensing program I handled in this country through an associate company of Century 21, which we still have, by the way, uh, was the Power Rangers, which was a huge success. So what I learned in my, th- my Thunderbird days, we put the good use in, um, in, in the Power Rangers. Okay. So how much of the format were you did with Star Wars well, I think we were we were leaders uh, at the time. There were uh, several um, uh, other companies in the field, obviously. Um, there was a chap in New Zealand fellow, Tuckwell, Walter Tuckwell. First thing he used to do in life was go into the florist in Berkeley Square and buy his carnation. He couldn't face the day without a carnation in his left buttonhole. But we, um, I think we would, we were enthusiasts. We had the energy. We had the drive and the good fortune to be handling a wonderful series of programs that it, it, it turned out to be. Um, it, we had a cold start with Supercar, but we built on it. 
one of the first deals we did was with TV Comic. They saw the strength of what we were doing, and we ran a weekly strip with them. And then we built um, a whole raft of licensees. The, uh, I say I went to one major toy company um, who gave me a fairly dusty reception, and I said, well, you know, don't really see the point of a meeting if you, if you don't want to seriously consider what we're talking about. Another toy company, um, Lesney, in fact, uh, had a charming meeting with them. And they said, well, we don't, uh, we don't advertise and we don't buy licenses. And I said, fine. Well, you know, times may change. And in fact, they have changed dramatically. Roll the film on 20 years. Lesney is now owned by a company out of Hong Kong. And they're heavily into licensing and heavily into advertising, which is part of, of, of modern marketing. But at the time, they said, no, no, we, our product doesn't need to be advertised. I was told, I said, okay, fine. So we had to go, we had to be fairly nimble and be creative because we were under-resourced when we started. You know, we didn't have uh, the capital that was required, but... Um, Companies today don't have the, the dot com companies that I did. You get that on film before? I hope you did. So we built our own empire, and it's amazing when you're on a roll, you can create the role and or uh, continue the role. And that's what we did. And, uh, does that give you some feel of, of what it was like? Uh, I'd like to think we were first in the field. Um, we devoted, we identified the opportunity, and we went for it. And the whole, we used to have meetings talking about the uh, licensing opportunities. And whilst, uh, unlike some of the programs today where you've got product placement and so forth, we used to build the merchandise in in a natural and spontaneous way. So it really belonged to the show. No more so than if you look at uh, the five vehicles in, in Thunderbirds, four of them which were hugely successful, plus in particular. Uh, Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce. We licensed that to uh, Dinky Toys in Liverpool. I used to go up there. It was a great pleasure. And they eventually sold in the UK alone two million pieces. Uh, it was die-cast, and they had to produce another uh, another set of tools because the first ones wore out. It was a hugely successful item. And that brought a lot of attention and focus because here was Dinky in those days, one of the leading companies. They eventually ran into problems, but uh, they were pretty powerful. And people liked to be associated with success and power, and that brought a lot of attention to what we were doing. But, uh, it was great stuff. Who were the devices of the product range? Well, I think it was really a, it was a joint effort. Uh, I can, we used to sit around uh, with a think tank, we call it in today's parlance, and be, I say five of us, there'd be Jerry there, and Sylvia, uh, Reg Hill, Reg was a lovely guy. He'd, um, Good morning, Keith. No. I say, Reg, I haven't even asked the question, but you you had to just get the guy warmed up. But he was great. And then John Reed and myself. And we used to sit around and we say, would this work? And we were not afraid of putting any idea on the table. Because if it didn't work, you'd just leave it on the table. If it did work, you'd pick it up and develop it. And uh, we were small enough and flexible enough to respond to ideas almost to the point of, you, know, you could change the script if it, if it made sense to build something in. And, uh, it was very much a team effort with Jerry uh, rightly leading and everybody happy to respond to that. You know, Jerry had this uh, knack of bringing the right people together and he brought a lot of talent into the company. Well, I'd like to think I was part of that. <laughs> about the idea for the uh, well, uh, I'm usually self-effacing, but I'd like to say it was definitely my idea. And at the time, I say the first uh, strip we did was with strip cartoon story, it was with a TV comic, which is Supercar. And that brought me into contact with a great guy called Alan Fennell, who eventually became, uh, I'm not sure if he's a full-time script writer, but he did a lot of the scripts, oh, well, quite a number of the series. And I used to sit down and brainstorm with Alan. And I said, Alan, I've got this idea for this children's comic. And I was very mindful of The Eagle, which uh, was the preeminent comic in those days, created by uh, a retired reverend. I don't know whether he was retired or not. Marcus Morris. And he came up with this good, clean comic for kids. 
uh, called Eagle, which was the most probably the most successful comic ever. And in its day, it was selling over a million copies a week. So I had this copy of Eagle. I said, "That's that's our model. That's what we're going to build on." And Alan went away after you know several meetings and came up with a, a marvelous dummy, which I was so excited about. I took it straight to a publisher. I'll come back in a moment, but. The working title was Century 21, because by that time we changed the name of the company from AP Films, which was a bit uh, anonymous, didn't mean anything, into Century 21, which I think reflected what we were about and what we were trying to do. So the working title for the comic was called Century 21, and it eventually became TV 21. We were very nervous about TV 21, because in those days, you know, acronyms and short, it didn't, it, I mean, it would work today, but it, in those days, I think, again, we were pioneering. And I took it to a publisher, and they said, we love it, but it's not our scene. I took it to Lou Grade. I said, Lou, we want to launch this. I want £30,000, please, to launch this comic. And he said, Keith, he said, go out and license it. And he introduced me to... Uh, well, before that, I, w- I went and had a meeting with, uh, of all people, the News of the World. It was run by the Carr family. And I met a guy, a lovely guy called Clive Carr, who's currently a director of Arsenal Football Club. And I go there most weeks now. And they had a company called City Magazines. And we did a joint venture with City Magazines. Uh, <clears throat> we were responsible for the editorial. And we uh, built a department eventually uh, in Fleet Street, 167 Fleet Street, and we had 120 people on the pay- payroll producing two comics and books or whatever. Uh, we, we did the creative side, and City Magazines did the uh, distribution and the promotion. And they had a wonderful guy there called John Little John, who was their distribution director. And he, his party trick was he'd read a list of names once or twice, and he'd come back to you, take it away, and he'd come back. With this, uh, he had a little party trick with him there. So we had this comic, uh, we launched it, I don't know, 63, 64, I can't remember the day. And we decided to have it printed in Liverpool by a firm called Eric Bemrose, I think they're still there. Um, went up with our team, and I was given a pride of place, and I pressed this green button to start the press rolling, and we printed 700,000 copies, which was a lot of paper. We put them in the shops, and we all went round like uh, expectant mums or whatever on the Saturday morning. And there were stacks of these papers in all the news agents, and we looked at each other and said, well, what have we done? By Tuesday, and I promise you, by Tuesday, we had a sellout. So we, I wouldn't say we had instant success, but it was... I, I've never seen anything quite like it, and the euphoria was unbelievable. And that continued. I mean, the circulation of that grew... Uh, in the following year, we launched, we launched another uh, children's weekly called Lady Penelope, and that eventually settled down to about 500,000 copies. So at, at our peak, we were selling 1.2 million copies per week of this publication. Uh, we took it to Holland, and we did a deal there. We had a, a Dutch-language edition selling 100,000 copies a week. Um, in, I can see the place now. It is uh, Leiden, I think. And it was a printer publisher. They were a gravure printer, and they had a pub- publishing arm. And we used to send over the, I don't know, I can't remember the films, and they used to do all the translation. So we had a, a sister publication in Holland doing 100,000, which was fantastic. We took the whole whole package to, uh, to Japan, which was our most successful. Uh, I'm going on about, you asked me about the paper. We can come back to Japan in a moment, but... Uh, so if you forgive the enthusiasm for this, would you? <laughs> there Wonderful. you go. Yeah, great. What Love a that. nice man. Mm. Erudite, full mm-hmm. of interesting uh, thoughts and recollections. Yes. Uh, there's more Keith next week. Now we uh-huh. uh, Sadly, Keith passed away in 2019. Uh, so we're extremely grateful to uh, Paul Huff and John Huff for sharing the uh, the tapes, which have given us access to this um, fascinating interview. Yeah. Now you can see a bit more of Keith in Jerry Anderson Live Uncharted, the extended edition, which is available now. Um, otherwise, you can wait until next week for more Keith Shackleton. So there you go. Great. Wonderful. So someone who was there right at the very beginning. That's extraordinary, isn't it? Well, he, I mean, yeah. really right before the very beginning. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and Amazing. me and Dad, is probably one of Dad's longest professional and social relationships, mm. I would say. Yeah. So. Uh, so do you mean friends or you, you 
avoiding that one. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I was just <laughs> trying to find a, a, a contrast professional. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, over on Twitter, people have been hashtagging us, Jerry Anderson Podcast. Uh, Lost in Transition, as uh, they do every week, actually, has uh, tweeted, heading off to work with these three highly entertaining chaps in my ears. That's, oh. uh, that's you, me, and Chris, of course, Jamie. Oh. Um, Makes on sense. the car speakers, he says, no headphones, so no soggy lug holes. Oh, Thanks cute. for making my Monday journey a lot more entertaining. Uh, Darren Huff said, I used to love The Protectors. Very underrated and not one that really gets a mention with it being a Jerry Anderson show. Cracking theme from Tony Christie in the avenues and alleyways. Of course, we all love that. Cassidy Egan, on a similar note, says, I recently watched UFO on the Legend Channel. That first episode, the only one directed by Jerry Anderson, is so funny, but I still can't tell if the misogyny was meant to be comic. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's different times, time. perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Howard Cooper, great to see UFO getting some love by uh, Jerry Anderson of Thunderbirds fame. The BBC thought they were getting a live-action version for kiddies. However, it's much better and much darker. You get really struck by just how much people smoked, though. <laughs> Oh, God, yes. Again, different right. time, right? Extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, the Vinyl Constituency tweeted, I'm watching the 1976 Larry Cohen sci-fi horror film God Told Me To, starring Tony LaBianco and Deborah Raffin. Look out for the scene featuring some manipulated generic stock model footage from Jerry Anderson's Space 1999. Uh... Really? It's a bit rude, isn't it? <laughs> Just nicking stuff. I love that. Thank you very much. It's a funny old world, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Scott McScribbler <coughs> says, I always watch a Jerry Anderson puppet show if I'm knackered. I reckon after a day's work, my brain has regressed to about a five-year-old's level from the normal eight-ish. Uh, <laughs> just a couple more. Paul the Cyclist. Jerry Anderson and the writers of Stingray and Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet, etc. designed a load of stuff that we take for granted now. Vertical takeoff and landing jets, video phones, reusable rockets, manned space stations, ray guns, lasers, satellites, and lots more. True. We are living in Jerry Anderson's future. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and, there's uh, loads of stuff that's come to pass. Yeah. Finally, the Cartoon Museum in London tweeted, We're excited to let everyone know that our newest capsule exhibition will be focusing on the comic series TV Century 21. The series supported Jerry Anderson's many marionette masterpieces from Thunderbirds to Captain Scarlet, and the exhibit opens Friday, 3rd of March. See you there. Uh, yes, oh, indeed. Great. It's exciting. It's brilliant. Yeah. Great, great nice. uh, helping bring that together. Yeah, good. Excellent. Uh, all for now. But yes, if you're on Twitter, why not hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast? Tag me, Richard N. James, him over there uh, with the tissue up to his nose. I'm Jamie Anderson. And uh, him over there standing by the randomizer, ever ready, Chris Dalek. Oh, well, it's lucky that he's ever ready next to the randomizer because yeah, isn't, it? Uh, isn't it about time for that? I think it is. Yeah, go on. Thank goodness for that. Well, I mean, you've pretty much said it, but Chris is about to randomly choose a random episode of a random Jerry Anderson show, so yeah. should we let him do that? Let's let him do that. Over to you, Randomizer. Well, it's real nice of you to come round and see me like this. But when did you get here? Oh, just now, actually. Although I've got to say, your music has been knocking me cold for years. Well, thanks. You're a bit of a knockout yourself, too, you know. Oh, well, gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's that, Marina? Oh, oh, right. Yes, of course. Sorry, you, you, you meant Marina. Yes. Uh... And I wish you'd call me Cass. Yeah, well, she can't actually call... Uh, anyway, I, I'm afraid to say we're here on business today, Cass. I, I don't see what the point is. Well, the point is that we need you to press the button on the old randomizer here to find out what episode I'll be watching today. Yeah, okay then. That's it, thank you. Sorry it all sounds like much of a muchness, but there's some folks out there who do seem to like it. I wonder... Marina likes you, by the way. And tomorrow she's up home again. Oh, well. That's show sure business. Yes, afraid so. Duty calls. Right, let's see. Ah, okay. Well, we're off to the Old West today. Not for Four Feather Falls, but for Joe 90. Funny guy, but he sure knows the business. Indeed. Here's Lone Handed 90. Still, like I say, he knows the business. Uh, yes, I think we got that bit, thank you. Well now, welcome back to Joe 90 on the randomizer. Or as the uh, music on the television that Joe is watching here might suggest. Yes, yeah, some Thunderbirds on that. Uh, he's watching a Western on the television. He's got his, his toy uh, Western train and car. He's got his little cowboy outfit. Ah, and uh, right away this episode is... Um, is is scoring big with me as obviously this show does all the way along the line 
But I think it's nice, firstly, that we just see Joe as a little boy. You've lost sleep. Dealing with this. You're driving 200 miles down here. Doesn't help me solve the problem, does it? Mac and Sam and Shane having a big old argument about the big rap, which is broken down. I invented it, remember? Can Joe assist? No, because he's just a nine-year-old boy. We've had this but breakdown for a week. He's got, you know, thoughts and ideas and suggestions of his own. And, you know, adults being adults sometimes. What if we... Look, I've already told you. They don't listen to children. Do this, will you? Well, I just thought... Now just do as you're told, Joe. There isn't anything you can do to help here. It's enough having these two onto me without you making it more difficult. He couldn't be more difficult than his own father. Yeah, straight away the setup is quite interesting and unusual. That's right. We'll make the decisions. And turn that television down. The adults are for once treating Joe... Uh, look. All I wanted to do was to make a suggestion. Well, it is intriguing. It does make you think that maybe... It's one of them! They care more about Joe for how they can use him rather than him as a person. Which, although you could you could sort of read that into other episodes, it is blatant here. Um, they've just told him to shut up and go away. Joe's back on the sofa watching his uh, exciting western. Uh, lots of special effects shots that don't quite seem to tie together in any particular story. But as we close in on Joe and his... Uh, He's got his blinking head on. We can see his subconscious is going to try to tie together not only those unconnected images, but those pesky, annoying adults who tell him what to do. Uh, yes, this is a dream episode. Um, but unlike the other dream episodes, or most of the other dream episodes, it doesn't do... Well, it, it tells you right away this is a dream. I mean, from that... That lovely shot there as we go into Joe's head uh, via a shot of him in the big rat with his, um, or in the, the rat trap I should say, wearing his cowboy costume. And here we are in Spoke City, ye old western town, and just straight away the whole thing looks beautiful. This is an episode by, I think Des, it's written by uh, Desmond Saunders and Keith Wilson, but I gather this was a very popular one for the, the crew to work on. I think the idea sort of came, it must have come out from like, you know, brainstorming in the pub or something. Some lovely puppetry there on the, uh, the cashier um, being held up as well at gunpoint in the bank. And instantly, this whole world is so believable. And it's been a few years since, um, well, what was AP Films, now Century 21, had actually done anything like this. We're seeing familiar faces holding guns. Let's go! Even though they're wearing bandanas, it's clearly Max, Sam and Shane. Just one more. The trouble with you two, you're just plum greedy. Yeah, we'd done a Western in Four for the Falls. We'd revisited it in um, Fireball XL5 with 1875. Hurry it up! I would have to assume some of what you're seeing in this episode in terms of props and things ooh, is reused from that, that show, but I would also assume not much. Okay, you guys, let's beat it. Because obviously all this is scaled to the new correctly proportioned puppets. Um, and some very nice body movements on the, the bank cashier there. Warm for you, friend. And Sam fired his gun, not Sam, Shane fired his gun and uh, it hit his inkwell and his face was splashed with, with the blue ink of the, the bottle as, you know, around. I think the that's a sort of um, allegory for in the Westerns, someone got shot and you might get a, a splatter of blood on someone's face. It's very clever. Help! Help! Fire! Oh my. Robbery! And some great voice acting in this one as well. Gary Files in particular Car. does a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of likeable Western characters. He's um, uh, the sheriff's deputy, but he was also that bank manager there. And again, just as the, the wind gang, for it is they, drive out of Spoke City, they crash through someone's garden, and you have just this little figure um, moving to watch them go. Do a whole lot better. Again, on HD, it doesn't look as great as maybe it did once, but it's just the, the level of attention and detail that's going into this. Even there's a little cemetery as they drive out of town. I know, but I'd like to stay alive to enjoy it for a little longer. Anyway, what's next, Chief? Next? A little gold consignment. In Altoona. And the nearest town to it is Joesville. Again, this is a, a great example of attention to detail. The three of them are making their escape in this knackered old car. And the the car on the puppet set is being shaken as an old car of that era would if it's about to fly apart at the seams. In the west, he'd have to be fast to handle the three of us alone. Yes, they're heading to Joesville. So named because of its great sheriff. Freak Rodeo. 
quit whining. You. I like that as well. Is it? I can never. I can never be sure if it's not. If it's. Is it Crickle Creek or Cripple Creek? Because I have a feeling they say both. But I just love the place. That I just love the idea of a place called Cripple Creek. But we're not there now. We're in Joesville. Laura Baden, folks, welcome. And there's a little poster of the Wing Gang. Oh dear. Yeah, I'm. If you're looking for anything critical in this episode, and I, I can understand that some people, um, you know, the the, the poor, uh, unenlightened fools that don't like Joe Ninety, even some who do like Joe Ninety might have a hard time with this episode, and I understand that. It's a dream episode. On the other hand, they're really seizing full opportunity here to, to make something really unique and different. You know, it's not like sure. dream episodes like in, in Stingray or, or UFO or whatever where... Okay, okay, old time. They play a scenario where it, it, it that looks really interesting and then at the end they go, Ah, oh, it was all a dream, fooled you. And it's like, oh no, we want to see that play out in the real world. Whereas this... The saloon, Sheriff! In the saloon! ...is just an excuse to have fun and be creative, crucially, as well. As the Wind Gang are now in town. They're at the Palace Hotel. Rooms? Homers? It says in the window. Something about Homers. Yeah. I could do another drink. I'd say you'd had enough, honey. This place could do with being livened up. Now, and this lady behind the bar here um, is, I believe, is named Sylvia, and the guy working the piano is named Jerry. Bar. Why don't you get lost, sweetheart? And a nice, I, I mean, this is not really probably age appropriate for kids, but they've made the Mac puppet look drunk. Obviously, he is drunk, um, but they've made him look drunk by just moving his eyes closer together. Thinking of pulling out. He's gone cross-eyed a bit. It's getting sweet. And it just looks perfect. Oh, chief, but uh, then she... It's also great, actually, as well, that... Let's talk about out... Out of the three of them in this dream, Mac is the one who probably who comes out the worst. Sam and Shane um, more or less resemble their, their regular selves, but Joe dreams of his father particularly in a, in a bad light. Biggest consignment of gold ever shipped by rail. Again, it's very revealing about the whole setup of the show. And we've we've had plenty of, of scenes in earlier episodes where the adults are sort of will be wheeled out. discussing their feelings about Joe and how he is used. We never really get the the flip side of that from Joe's point of view. And as he comes into the saloon, the piano stops. The puppets just look at each other. It is very nice and atmospheric. These nice long point of view tracking shots as Joe walks over to the bar. What's he going to order? While it be, Sheriff. Whiskey, Sheriff. We're sliding it down the bar. Milk. On the rocks. Yeah. Sure, Sheriff. Hmm. I get the feeling as well this must have been fun for the voice actors too. And all three of the, the adult regular characters, they look really quite good as, as sleazy outlaws. Just waiting on Joe. He's had the milk delivered. Again, they're, they're following every um, Western movie and, and film trope in the book here. Letting Joe reach out towards his glass slowly, silently. And then... Oh! Again, li um, live-action hand insert shots there. Jerry, keep it going. And so much glass flying about the place. I know it's not real glass, but it, it does all look very convincing. Not so much these shots of Joe and Sam kind of leaning around the edge of the bar, firing at each other. Hold it right there. And uh, the deputies appeared from nowhere. Deputy Doc smashed a chair over Shane. Don't. Sylvia is going to shove some kind of blamange in Mac's face. Lesson to you. Don't never be rude to a lady. Great work, Sue, Doc. Hmm. Okay, you guys, get your hands up. We'll get even with you, Sheriff. Yeah, Joe doesn't need no magic guns, talking horses or talking dogs. Yeah. He has... Uh, he has two guns, but he also has friends armed with chairs and blamanges. That's a nice poster of the uh, the wing gang there. I suspect that is um, Keith Wilson artwork. Just cool your heads off in there for a spell. Sheriff here. Trouble down the Cripple Creek Rodeo, Sheriff. Can you 
come. There has been a crippling. I've never noticed that before. As um, uh, Doc is locking the wing gang in the cell, you see him from behind. He's got a patch on his on his bottom. Just again, attention to detail, implying that at some point he ripped his pants and had to patch them over with with different color material. Okay, sheriff. Don't worry about a thing. Hmm. Not a dang thing. Not a doggone ding dong diddly dang thing. As the uh, camera closes in on, holds on the keys, which of course, being a Western, the keys are within feasible reach of those locked in the cells. And Doc has gone to sleep. I'm trying to work out where the um, the map on the wall behind him is of. Oh, there's even stains all down the front of Doc's top. Something else I, I like in this episode as well is they've made really good um, selections with the guest puppets in terms of who's playing these these roles. Because this is um, the Dr. Magnus puppet from Captain Scarlet playing uh, Doc, appropriately enough here. Also, um, the bank guy who got held up earlier was, was Jason Smith. But they're also using, um, later on in this episode, we'll meet the train driver, Hank. And um, the guy in the saloon playing the piano was... Um, Miguel Lamberto dos Passos Francesca, but they've they've really made good selections here of either ugly puppets. Hank in particular is quite ugly, or just they look era specific. Again, that's just something I, I think is such a, a nice idea and so fun picking out puppets. Who's going to play the guest character in this particular episode? All I've waffled over here is. Um, Sam has managed to retrieve the keys. They're on the desk. He set up some sort of uh, fishing line type thing. Doc has slept through them. He's scratching himself while he sleeps. Again, that's being worked from below. You and Mac take care of the deputy. I'll get the guns. Right, Chief. And as much fun as this must have been to film, uh, and I was actually speaking about it with uh, Mike Trim when I interviewed him for the Joe 90 Blu-rays. He did a lot of the design work on this one and remembers it quite fondly. I think also you've got to look at this and think, were there people working on the Anderson shows at this time who A, sort of saw the writing on the wall in terms of the future of this kind of filmmaking, but also B, were like, Let's get out of here. we can do other things than the... You know the sci-fi bordering on fantasy kind of worlds that we've been, we've become known for, and perhaps sort of stuck in for a while. We could do a western that is technically superior to Four Feather Falls. We could do any number of things. Oh, pardon. Because we've got so many talented and creative people on staff. Just I don't know. It would have been great if um, maybe they'd done like a. A sort of showcase series, say 12 or 13 episodes, just each one with a different format and a different scenario, a different set of characters, like a western, like, I don't know, a historical maybe, just unexpected, unusual Super Marionation y scenarios. Anywho. What's the trouble? Hold on. Again, I, I have to imagine that's fun in the studio. Gary Files was recording the sound of Doc tied up. Um, calling for Joe on the phone as the office is burning. My dear, why have we stopped? Look, we made the plan. I figure we stick to it. Well, and this is also a good episode for for, for examples of why I think won't make this, mountain this is a, such a great series, in particular the voice acting here in this scene. What risk? With Rupert Davies, David Healy and Keith Alexander, they are so good at Look, I'm just arguing and sniping and making this dialogue seem very realistic. I said Altoona. Look, chum, I'm driving... Three people with different ideas, different ways that they want to take their their car. They're heading for the, uh, the, the train with the gold consignment. Joe's office is, um, is a blazing inferno, but they still put this poor Doc puppet on the set. Okay. So you have to remember as well, there are puppeteers standing not that far over those flames. That's stubborn That's old... enough. If, God forbid, anything went wrong on, on the bridge and they fell in, they'd be in serious trouble. Stop it, I tell you. To say nothing of the puppet. It'll be on its way any time now. We can still make it. I won't do it. I've told you this car... Won't and, be again, just... The, the car is stopped. This is a completely static image, and yet... It's beautiful to look at the cactuses. There's the skeleton of some large animal there. There's dry, cracked, arid 
Western desert environment. Look, you two. <laughs> this bickering continues. Oh, I love it. Now that's the sheriff's office gone up in flames. Was near thing, sir. If I'd been any more incompetent, I'd have been dead. Did you get to hear where they were heading? Like I was about to tell you, Sheriff. I think I heard him saying they could make it to the border. The but I was asleep and scratching myself at the time. Their hearts set on that gold in Altoona. And they could make it there before the Mail Express. Unless... What's that, Sheriff? Doc, they're desperate men and greedy. I'll stake my reputation on them making a play for that gold. I'm going to be on that train and I'll stop them if I bust. You be careful, Sheriff. They're real mean. <laughs> With the sort of pack. Oh, this is a nice relationship, actually, between these two. And I also think I should really credit Len Jones for coming coming across as um, quite a good leading man in this episode. Because aside from Doc, he doesn't really have anyone to um, to sort of support him or fall back on in the way that he normally would with Sam and Mac and Shane. Who's waiting? Who are still arguing. No, they've decided... They're going after the train. Thank goodness. And yet again, showing the the improvements since the Four Feather Falls days. The setup of Joesville is quite similar to how Four Feather Falls looked and was played. We can get Hank. Don't you worry now, Sheriff. We'll make it. Come on, old girl. You just show the Sheriff here what you can do. Yeah, Gary Files is doing so many Old West accents in this episode. <laughs> And the Hank puppet does still exist. I think uh, I've seen him at um, a couple of conventions over the years. Come on, old girl. You can make it. What's wrong with this thing? You sure the brake's off? I love as well Mac's uh, faith in this old car, considering it's not even his. He just stole it. And there's a real... Not only is this, uh, this stuff with the train and the car racing alongside lovely to look at, but there's a real sense of <laughs> of building energy throughout this what is about to become a chase sequence as the uh, the train emerges from the tunnel just s seconds too uh, too early. Um, the wing gang are heading to the crossing. Oh, see again, they're, they're sliding the car on the puppet stage. It's terrific. Yeah, just too late there. What in blue blazes? Are you trying to kill us or something? You see what's happened with all your talk? They've got in front of us, and I can swear it was the sheriff in the cab of that train. Oh. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. You sure? You sure? You sure? After him. Hmm. Oh, this looks so lovely. I mean, I, I, I have a feeling this is a bit of a fan favorite episode of Joe Ninety. It's certainly one of mine. But it's always just been lovely to look at, even pre HD. There's just so much inventiveness and creativity in this whole story. Yeah, looks like we licked him, Sheriff. I'm not so sure about that. And this, again, the train cab set, is, it's so simple and yet so beautiful once it's integrated with the model shots. This thing going any faster? I've got my foot right down now. What's this thing here? We have a supercharger. Pull on that. <laughs> and suddenly the thing is hurtling along like a bomb. Uh, quite similar, in fact, to uh, Jeremiah Tuttle's uh, old car in The Imposters. That had a similar thing. Keep her going! Keep her going! We're gaining on them! The car is easily going to gain on the train at this point now. This is what I mean by the sense of increasing energy and... Uh so many as well just interesting camera angles they get on the car racing alongside the train here i'm ready for you oh and of course i should probably mention actually considering that uh, i suspect none of this music was ever reused again this is a, a, a beautiful score from uh, from barry gray for this episode you can forgive him in fact for for lifting that uh, thunderbirds music earlier instead of specially composing something new because he really had his work cut out for him here with this yeah, we're getting Joe's point of view from the train and the the baddie's point of view from the car. Oh! Don't oh. stop! Don't stop! Shane's been knocked out of the car. I've never been quite sure about that shot of him riding around on the floor. But, uh, yes, the wing gang are now minus Shane. Just Mac and Sam. They have managed to overtake the train, which has now entered a tunnel. 
I want this this shot. Oh, this gives me chills. Where the car just gets over the track in front before the train comes out and uh, heads over the crossing. Beautiful stuff. But now, oh, it looks like the, the train is starting to overheat. Yeah, the boiler's into the danger zone. We're into the red. Even Hank can't do anything to uh, ah, they're losing steam. To stop him from losing steam. You just look where you're going. Look out! Oh! Hit a cactus. Ooh, ooh. And that's Sam knocked out of the uh, the car. So now it's just Mac in this car, which is also uh, starting to um, well fall apart. <laughs> Off comes the steering wheel. Uh, yes. And it's rare as well that um, Rupert Davies is given any comedy material in this series, but as the car lumbers to a stop on the track directly in front of the train... Oh no! We get this scream. Ah! <laughs> I just love it, the image of, of this distinguished actor in, in Rupert Davies standing in the studio going... Ah! As the, uh, yes, I think he managed to escape, but sadly... Sheriff Joe, Hank, and the train destroyed. That's it. Sheriff Joe is dead. All right, Sam. Come on. Or is he? He was never really here, was he? Keep her going. We must. We must stop the wind gang. And there's a lovely tone to this final scene as well as Joe's woken up. Come on. You've been dreaming of a nice, gentle, reassuring tone from particularly Rupert Davies, but the way they are all quite apologetic to how they treated him earlier. Sorry, we were a bit short with you, Joe, but we've all been head up about the breakdown on the big rat. But we think we've got a solution, huh? So it looks as if you'll be making that trip to Arizona after all. Yay! No, but it won't be anything like the Arizona in that cowboy picture you've just been watching, Joe. We're sending you to a lab where a scientist is breeding mutant piranhas at the bottom of a volcano. It was like this. I was the sheriff of this town, and you, Uncle Sam, and Mr. Weston were all out there. And you see, you were... And we just pan away from Joe to the TV. Ah, well, that was Lone Handed 90. And um, even though we haven't had the randomizer turn up at an episode of Joe 90 for quite a while, I've got to say, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, I hope you did too, because this has um, long been one of my favourite episodes. Yeah, teleplay by Desmond Saunders and Keith Wilson. It is very rare to see two names credited for, for one script, um, certainly in this area of the Anderson shows. Yeah, just all round superb stuff. A lovely setup for a dream episode. And you know, all these shows, they have to have their dream episode. By and large, they're not very good. This one is has got to be up at the top of the pile. All the way along the line, creativity abounds. So much fun. Everyone seems to have really brought their A-game for such a, a unique and special story. Obviously, at this time, uh, westerns on television were were in vogue and um, you know probably just about coming to their their end essentially but it's lovely to see the series looking at how a, a real boy of the 1960s might um, you know might imagine himself as a, a sheriff of a western town and how he incorporates all his his friends and, and family into that world so yeah all the way along the line a rather spectacular episode of Joe 90 creative imaginative and just a whole heap of fun good stuff ah oh. Bit of Joe uh, 90. Yeah, we mm. love that, don't we, Jamie? It's great, isn't it? When you're feeling a bit ill, it's just what you need to pick yourself up. Yeah, it's really, it's really perked me up. And, yeah, um, great. And, Excellent. And thought, at least I don't have to watch any more of that. Um, <laughs> no, enough. I mean, I'm, I don't want to say uh, I'm going to change my opinion anytime soon, but I, I, there's, well, I've got a slight, a, a slight softening spot right. for some aspects of Joe 90. Okay. Well, look, if I could change my opinion on Fab Facts... There's hope for you yet. Hang on, you very quickly changed it back during <laughs> Fat well, Facts today. Right. I, so I gave it a go, though, didn't I? Not really, no. Oh, well, um, sorry. But no, it, it's, uh, that's not, not a terrible one. Quite no. fun and, and a bit milky bar, kid, but qu quite yeah, fun. Yeah. So <laughs> Anyway. Yeah. Great. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, there we are. Chris will be back later on, of course. And someone has already mentioned on the podcast here that he does have his own uh, very own randomizer podcast he that does. you can also subscribe to. There are a few behind, so if you missed any you know, in the early days, they'll all be there for you. Uh, mm. And you can then perhaps listen to our podcast and then treat yourself to a little, you know, a moose bouche 
with uh, with Chris Dale afterwards and pick one of his randomizers. Do amuse bouches come after the meal? No, they don't, do they? No, they come before, don't they? Yeah, where the well, amuse bouche? <laughs> fair enough. Absolutely fair enough. Uh, in the meantime, I do have to say one thing before we go, Jamie. Oh, uh, mm, mm. is it just one? Mm, it's a. I'll say it in one sentence if that helps. <laughs> Okay. Please, could you subscribe to the Jerry Anderson podcast in whichever platform you're listening to us on and leave us a nice review or a rating or a rating to tell people how much you enjoy the show and then perhaps copy and paste the link into all your socials so people can hear us too. Wow. <gasps> oh. Goodness me. I thought Ran we were going to expire quickly. then. Yeah, sorry. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, I won't do that again. Okay, I think I'll well, put some pauses in next time. Smart. Thank you yeah. uh, for, for requesting that. Yeah. Um, now, I will say we have had mm-hmm. a few new reviews. A few new reviews? Yeah, quite a few new reviews. Great. Um, which I'm very pleased to see. And we might, I might just pick and choose some of those in the uh, oh, yeah. after credits. Oh, yeah, go chat. on. Then. Yeah, great. Come on then. Right, let's say goodbye because I want to hear those. Oh, all right, fine. Uh, Do they so, mention me? Well, I don't know yet. I haven't read them. I'll oh. find out oh, shortly. Okay, go on then. Right. Uh, so, yes, Pulse Runs will be, we'll be back in your. Uh, clammy or um, moist or even dry lug holes me. next week all right goodness yes, me sorry yes we'll be back next week yes. and if you are writing a review please do mention richard because oh. otherwise i'll never hear the end of it <laughs> uh, so we will be back in pod two for four uh hmm. next week okay two for four and we might cover some um, uh, romantic things because it's it's that's Valentine's oh, is it Day week, isn't it? Oh, I see. Okay, great. So um, there nice. you go. Lo- right. Already looking forward to that uh, that date in the back of the uh, expensive uh, car with the. Uh, <coughs> st- anyway, okay, moving right. on. Yeah. Uh, okay. Goodbye, everyone. Have All a great right. week. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Bye. Let's go. Spectrum is green. Okay, well, let's. Um, oh, go on then. Yes, let's hope oh, that something yeah. here mentions you. I'm just having a. <laughs> oh no. Um, okay, well, there's one that mentions you. Okay, great. There's another one that mentions you. Oh, good, good. Okay, good. There's good, another excellent. one that mentions you. Right. Okay. Are we going to hear any of them, or are you just going to say that? That one does also mention you. Oh, good, good, good. That one doesn't mention okay. you. Oh, that don't one read that one doesn't out. mention either of us. Interesting. How can you leave a review for the Jerry Anderson podcast? And well, there we are. That yeah, one on. both. Are you going to read any out? Yes, all right. I'm just I just wanted to check to see if there's any any particularly rude ones, but sadly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um uh, so here's one. Hmm. Um, Spaceman 42. Oh yeah. Oh, it was quite long. Oh, cool then. Five I'll stars. Back. Mm-hmm. A weekly visit to Jerry Anderson Fantasyland with jovial hosts Jamie, I have a fab fact. You pro- you've probably <laughs> already heard Anderson. <laughs> All right. I, I like it already. And Richard, I worked on Space Precinct, don't uh, you know, James? Yeah, we are. <laughs> a enough. light-hearted reminder of classic television, future projects and coming merchandise, probably aimed at the younger generations, what? casual fans or normal people, nostalgically <laughs> wanting to become acquainted with Anderson history. Along oh. in the tooth, older listeners who have lived through 50 years of fandom will probably have heard it all before, uh, oh. but should find something to entertain them. Usually, Chris Dale's episode musings, the weekly yep. guest interview, or yep. shouting out all the answers to questions before they're given. <laughs> F-A-B. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, all that is absolutely fair enough, isn't it? It is. It is. I would I'm, agree with all of that. I like the idea that we... Um, uh, we appeal to the younger generation. I know. I've never considered that before. I know, but look at us go. It's a bit uh, odd, isn't it? I'm going to give you one more here. Jojo okay. from TB2 says, oh, yeah. when I found out these podcasts were being made, yes. I knew I had to listen. Ooh. Because I love Jamie and Richard on Fab Live. Oh, gosh. Yeah. There we go. There we must be. I was not disappointed. Ah. They're both just as great on the podcasts. And yeah. so is Chris with the Randomizer too. Yeah. I enjoy each and every segment, and it never fails to make me laugh out loud or perk up my mood. Oh, that's nice, yeah, isn't it? What that's a lovely what review. Like. That's, that's what we like. Oh, yeah. That's the one. That's the one. I feel all warm and fuzzy now. There you go. Uh, that's 
That's a tonic, isn't it? A review oh, like that. It is. It is. Yeah, Makes you feel better. So thank Good. you for that. You're uh, welcome. No, uh, I mean, I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm what? That wasn't me. Sorry, what? go on. It wasn't what? Wasn't you? No, that, that review. You t- go on. Just carry on. Okay. I was going to say. I feel like I should write a review of you now. Just me. What, yeah. My, my performance in the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm okay. going to go and work on that, and I will send it over uh, le- next week. <laughs> okay. All right. I look forward to that then. All right. Okay, fine. Good. Yeah. You can do you're gonna do me as well? Oh, I'll think about it if I can think of anything nice to say. Oh, okay. I'll give you a few more weeks in that case. <laughs> yeah, I would. Right. All right. I hope you feel better soon, Jamie. Thank you, and enjoy the warm glow of two reviews. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment Production.